Hello, um, I'm Deidre Figueredo. I'm the director of Crowd Space based in Birmingham. And I'm also co-curator of our touring exhibition, which is called We Are Commoners, uh, which is currently <clears throat> showing at Make Southwest, um, which was formerly the Devon Guild um, here in Devon. And it will be touring the country for another six months after that. Um, but the exhibition We Are Commoners uh, features UK and international artists and the projects exhibited there represent ideas and resources to inspire acts of commoning. Um, there's an idea that craft skills and materials provide a means to common or um, are used to give insight into examples of commoning um, in this country and elsewhere. Uh, so that, that is principally what the exhibition is about. But activating the word to common is seen really in the exhibition as a way to renew public life, um, a life where we can connect to produce shared rituals uh, and resources that we look after together, and where getting involved through cooperation, mutual care and exchange um, can somehow heal and make change in our communities. And there, um, there are a couple of quotes about the commons that I think are probably some it up quite well in terms of what it means. So Peter Barnes um, is somebody who set up a forum and a publication called On the Commons. Um, and he was a co-founder of that. And he describes the commons simply as things we share, places we share, systems we share, ideas we share, culture we share. And then alternatively, there's um, a researcher, a writer, academic called Justin Kenrick. Uh, and he describes the commons as um, life-sustaining life or life-enhancing resources and services that have not been divided up and assigned a monetary value in the global economy, but instead are shared according to evolving arrangements and agreements among members of a community or a group. They range from the air we breathe, pollination provided by bees, land that provides food for gathering, sharing, cultivating and dwelling, rather than selling to libraries, public parks, pavements we walk along and on childcare, care for the elderly and words of comfort given freely and willingly rather than at an hourly rate. So I think that sort of encompasses you know, quite a lot of what the Commons is about. Um, so today's panel um, sits uh, in amongst a day of commoning at um, the um, Make Southwest venue where the exhibition is showing. And as part of that, we've convened this panel and our panelists have very kindly come along to share their thoughts with us. Um, and the theme today is Fashion Commons, uh, clothing as a shared resource, which I think um, you could spend a long time talking about because there, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot to say and there are a lot of people around the world addressing this very urgent um, issue and trying to make change happen. So three of those people are um, Amy Twigger Holroyd. Amy, could you give us a wave? Uh, and uh, so Amy is a designer, a maker, and a researcher, and a writer, and is also associate professor in fashion and sustainability in the School of Art and Design at Nottingham Trent University. Um, we have um, Joni Willett with her cat. Give us a wave, Joni. Thanks for being here. So Joni uh, is a senior lecturer in politics um, with the University of Exeter uh, and is based in the Environment and Sustainability Institute um, on the Penryn campus down there in Falmouth. Um, Joni was a co-investigator for the um, Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, project designing a sensibility for sustainability project, which um, she'll talk a little bit, a bit about later. Uh, and then we've got Jane Dean. Give us a wave, Jane. Uh, and Jane is actually a member of um, Make Southwest. And Jane is a textile designer and tutor working with fibre, yarn and dyes um, and has been involved in spinning, dyeing and weaving for a massively long time, over 40 years, uh, as a tutor and a practitioner, sharing her skills. Um, Jane's taught in the Middle East, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, all over the place. Um, 
and um, we'll we'll talk about um, her membership of um, Fibre Shed in the southwest, which is a global network anyway, um, and her approach to to her making a little bit. So I thought for the first um, fifteen minutes or so that each um, of our contributors today, panelists, will just give us a little bit of context um, about uh, their perspectives and where they're coming from before we get into our discussion. So um, if I could invite you, Amy, to kick off, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Deirdre. Really, really good to be here. Looking forward to a good, good chat. Um, so yeah, if I kind of start with the idea of the fashion commons, um, I first started thinking about fashion as a commons about 12 years ago. I have to add it up um, to thinking back. Um, it was when I was first playing around with ideas for my PhD research. Um, and it was really prompted by my frustrations with fashion um, and a feeling I had that the sort of industrialization and professionalization of fashion um, that's taken place over the past decades um, has really limited people's sense of what they can do with their clothes. So kind of what we can wear, how we can wear it, what's available for us to buy. The fact that we're so trained to kind of think that buying is the first or the kind of default option anyway and all other um, kind of alternatives are, are seen as a slightly um, risky path off of the kind of default. Um, and I think the kind of frustration that I felt with that and sort of sense of injustice, I suppose, um, somehow my brain connected it with high school history lessons uh, when we learned about the enclosure of common land in England, uh, which of course took away a shared resource that enabled, you know, a certain way of life and replaced it with private ownership to the benefit, of course, of the rich and the powerful. Um, and I think I quite instinctive, it was very instinctive. I found that I was kind of thinking about fashion in a similar way. Um, I think about fashion as a resource that I think should belong to everyone, uh, but actually has something that's been kind of guided and structured in a way that benefits uh, kind of consumerist industry. And I would say as well, kind of limits the satisfaction that people can get from fashion. Um, so it was that line of thinking that led me to the idea. It was kind of through, through thinking about enclosure, actually, that led me to thinking about, well, what would the alternative be? The alternative would be fashion as a commons, this kind of vibrant and really varied and diverse kind of shared resource. Um, you can use the, the idea of fashion as a commons quite flexibly, you know, it's kind of conceptual link, so you can take it in lots of different directions. Um, I do sometimes use it in really quite a conceptual way, uh, thinking about sort of ways of wearing clothes, styles, traditions, textile knowledges, ways of making and caring for clothes that are kind of um, can be shared as, as, a, as a, a kind of resource. Um, I also sometimes use it in a more practical sense. Um, you can use it as a way of thinking about sort of the clothing stock of a community or a region or a country. So you could think about sort of the national wardrobe, all of the clothes that are sitting in our wardrobes, our closets, our lofts, our charity shops, our textile banks. Um, and though, you know, we often might think about the wardrobe in an individual way, um, when you think in this kind of collective way, it's really such a, a colossal and massively underused resource. You know, there's all kinds of statistics about the huge proportion of clothes in our wardrobes that we don't wear. And mine are behind me with all the clothes that I don't wear. <laughs> so I fully include myself in that. Um, so the, uh, the, the Blue Fashion Commons installation that's in the exhibition is based on this idea. So thinking about a kind of a commons of garments um, and seeing what happens if we think about this collective wardrobe as a kind of shared resource, the kind of library that you can borrow from for a shorter or longer time. So just all clothes is a library. What happens if we think about it like that? We borrow them for a bit, for a week, for a, a year, for a decade, for a lifetime, but then we return it to the commons. Um, and so I wanted to find a way of kind of bringing that to life and, and surfacing the commons ideas that are within it. Um, so that's where the, the installation idea came from. Um, and it's connected to a research project that I'm running called Fashion Fictions. Um, and the, the project brings people together to imagine, experience and reflect on alternative fashion worlds. So we imagine kind of parallel worlds where people live with their clothes a bit differently. 
um, as a way of opening up conversations around possibilities for the fashion system. So it's a really participatory project. People are invited to uh, contribute kind of short written outlines of parallel worlds. And then people in other places work collaboratively to kind of pick up that idea and, and develop it further and even try to kind of bring it to life. Um, so the, the installation is an enactment of a world that I wrote uh, where blue clothing can no longer be bought and sold, only exchanged. Um, so obviously that, you know, that sphere of, of that, that type of item is kind of moving from the world of, of private commerce into the sphere of the commons. Um, allowing us to explore different ideas for kind of how the economy can be um, uh, explored and kind of constituted. Um, so yeah, the idea is that the thing in the exhibition is a community hub from the parallel world. Um, the hub is a place where blue clothing can be exchanged and mended um, and actually every last scrap is valued because blue clothes and no, blue textiles are no longer produced the ones that you have become you know very very increasingly precious over time um and this hub has been transported through a portal into the exhibition conveniently um and people are invited to kind of experience this alternative way of using and living with with clothes so yeah they can come along and kind of exchange clothes and they can also mend or embellish their clothes while they're there using the supplies that are there um but it's not a free for all. And yeah, you know, that's a key element of the commons. Um, there need to be kind of conventions on how you can use the resource. Um, so there's a sense of collective responsibility as well as collective benefit. The two things go together. Um, so yeah, it's been really nice to kind of set that up and then see what happens. Great, thank you. Um, Joni, can you? Sure, oh, and uh, um, apologies for for Cosmo, who um, has you know who who really likes attention from anybody, including every, you know everybody here on this call. Um, uh, yeah, so um, so my journey into this is is um, maybe a little bit non traditional. So I'm actually a, I'm a politics academic, um, and I'm really interested in the way that um, the way that people create and generate meanings and ideas around things. And then how those sort of transfer between things and other things and stuff like that. Um, conceptually, I'm really interested in affect. Um, uh, what's also really been quite interesting over the past couple of years that we've been really exploring this is the way that politics, um, academic politics, doesn't really look very much at all about the politics of clothing. Um, and Although there is a lot of material, a lot of scholarly material about the politics of clothing, that's all coming from a kind of a textiles, arts and fashion kind of perspective rather than from within politics. Um, but we were having a lot of discussions about sustainable clothing and about um, what, um, you know, yeah, what kind of some of the, the issues were um, with regards to clothing and sustainability, but also about things like behavior change and how we create behavior change. And that's where we ended up generating or um, uh, 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 doing the uh, designing a sensibility for sustainability project. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. at the bottom line, we were really interested in how you in how behavior change becomes created and how that might be, you know, something around around clothing and sustainability. And um, so what we did is over a nine month period, um, we invited um, participants to um, to join us on a journey, making, mending and modifying clothing, um, working collaboratively. So we brought together this group of people who are all interested in this topic, um, at various skills levels. So we had some people that had a lot of textile skills, a lot of making skills. We had some people who really did not at all. They were just at the very beginning of their learning journey. And we put, we brought everybody together and we just sort of saw what happened. So we started out at the very, you know, at the, at the absolute basics. So we started out um, uh, introducing, the series was called From Fluff to Fibre. So like um, uh, introducing um, participants to a, um, a, a sheep farm where they make wool from the sheep on their farm um, and to dyeing and weaving and then we ended up going on to sort of you know things like knitting and making clothing and uh, mending and modifying clothing as well. So it was really quite an extensive journey and what we were doing over the course of this project is we were looking to see 
um, we recorded the discussions that were that were had around this process, um, and uh, we just wanted to see what happened really. Um, but what was really really fascinating, um, and it certainly got me reflecting a lot, is that being it's being exposed to how complicated clothes are. You know, not just I mean, I don't I don't you know um, uh, um, a, a lot of us just go into a shop and buy something and don't really think about it. It's a fully you know it's a it's a fully created garment. We don't think about the various different tiny little components that it's made out of or the processes that have gone through those components, you know, um, uh, or that those components have gone through the people that have been involved in that process. We just don't think about that until we're really exposed to it and encouraged to reflect really deeply about it. And it was really interesting being part of that learning environment or kind of milieu um, around clothes, the materiality of clothes meant that we were able to just think in a lot and I think a lot more deeply and I think that affected all of us regardless I mean for the most part people told us that they certainly you know that they certainly looked at clothing in a different way how that has translated to a long-term uh, a long-term impact on people's clothing purchases or practices is another matter entirely that's something else to explore but, um, but it certainly had encouraged people to reflect and it made me think an awful lot about how when we're in an environment, so like imagining that I'm part of a friendship network, I'm not, but imagining I'm part of a friendship network that really values, that values new stuff and looking really good and all of that kind of thing. The, to then wear your made clothes, which might have imperfections, or things that have been um, mended or modified, which may well have, you know, have by definition have imperfections, um, uh, becomes a lot more challenging because you're kind of you're constantly having to battle how your 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 peer group is imagining you. Whereas when you're a part of a milieu that is um, that is supportive of what you're exploring and trying out then that means that you can learn the skills and start to really flourish and the other so so being a part of a group um, or being a part of a, of a kind of a commons means that you, you know, are able to develop in a much more supported and interesting kind of way we also found it was really important to allow participants to um, to create their own knowledges so you know to really think about how the stuff that they were learning fitted with what they you know fitted with how they understood the world so it's kind of like it's co-creation rather than a this is what you must think kind of thing um yeah but uh, i think that's as far as i want to go with it but um yeah it was a really oh yeah the final thing was that about how being a part of that group became a really mutually supportive space so we were getting people saying about how they'd got really complicated things going on in their lives but they they valued being a part of the group um, we had a group in Cornwall and a group in um, uh, West Midlands, but, but, but being a part of, the, of their group um, was such a really important supportive environment outside of clothing, just talking about life stuff, that they prioritised coming to the group rather than dealing with whatever life stuff that they were. So that was really interesting as well. There was just so many, so many benefits to it. It was wonderful and a real privilege to have been a part of. Great, thank you, Joni. Um, we'll come back to many ideas that um, both of you have uh, touched on there. So, um, Jane, if I can invite you to uh, give us your perspective and set the scene for us, please. Well, one of the things that has always really fascinated me is how you take raw materials and convert them into something that um, is different. I mean, obviously made of the same thing, but 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 not not in the same form as the original was. And the other thing which um, has always fascinated me is how clever people were before we had technology and industrialization. And I suppose part of the, the, the reason why I, I use the skills I do is, is because partly to keep them alive, but also because I think there tends to be a, 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 well, everything we do now is so much better than what we did 100 years ago. And actually, it's the other way around. Um, 
well, to some extent, it's the other way around. I mean, we can do some really, really stunning and clever things with industry these days, but we can also do some, the same with methods that we've been using for, that humans have been using for thousands of years. And I, I hate the fact that today we, our farmers get nothing for, or virtually nothing, for a really sustainable uh, natural source, I'm talking about wool, um, that can be used in all sorts of things. It can be used in house insulation, it can be used uh, for people insulation, it can be used um, for, I mean, there's a, there's a chap near us who, who makes furniture out of wool. It can be used as felt, it can be used as this, that, and the other, and um, it all gets, it, it, it's a rather, despite the efforts everybody's making to try and, and bring it back into focus, it's still, uh, well, it, you know, it's, it's not easy care, it's not this, it's not that, it's not the other. Um, and so we go on producing more and more stuff when we've actually got the basics um, available to us. Um, because I like raw materials and because I like making um, a, a something from a, a very basic, like dyeing from a plant or something like that, um, I'm also very interested at, and involved to some extent on the fringes of a, um, a project that's happening through Fibre Shed at the moment, which is growing flax. And there is a wonderful barn quite near me where the group of people who have, and, and the person who's leading the project, have um, grown and harvested um, about an acre of wonderful flax that is hanging up in bunches, looking glorious, looking really, you know, you go into the barn and you, even if you don't know anything about it, you just go, oh, wow, what is that? Um, it's hanging up and we're hoping that we will get it processed and, and that I will be able to show people how to spin it. Um, and the long term goal is that there will be a, a um, an organisation in Plymouth that will be weaving bolts of linen cloth. Um, there's a very, very long way to go. Um, but that's the that, that we're hoping to introduce lots of people into that so that they will be they will get um, they will get the understanding and the pleasure of being able to to work with something like that from the ground up and produce something that is really worthwhile. Um, I was very interested in, in, in one of the things, um, it, you know, historically certain colours have been hard to get and so only the wealthy were allowed to use them. Um, <laughs> there are also things um, like, I, I was mentioning this earlier, that uh, my mother was one of five sisters and they had one or two party dresses. And every time somebody was going to a party, they took the hem down or they took the hem up or they put, changed the buttons or they sewed something attractive on it or they took something off that they didn't like. And those, those dresses appeared in different guises, um, who knows how many times. And nobody thought that that was a, a peculiar thing to do. It was the thing to do. And I think we've lost so much contact with the means of production of textiles and the skills and knowledge and, and the sheer pleasure actually of um, creating and being proud of what you've, you've made because it's so much nicer to put something that you have made uh, from scratch and someone says, oh, that's really nice, than going into Marks and Spencer's and buying something off the peg. Mm. Um, so that's really, that, that's what motivates me. Thank you, Jane. Um, um, I, something that strikes me from things that all of you have reflected on and said just now and from the pre-conversations that we have it is, and I think Jane mentioned that word this morning, which is, you know, autonomy, that sense of of reclaiming one's uh, autonomy in uh, a process that is um, quite linear process of, you know, design of clothing manufacture off to the retailer bought by, by the consumer in that kind of linear way, which I think Jodie, you were, we were talking about, you were mentioning yesterday. 
um, and it, it's it's that uh, ability to disrupt that linear process. Um, uh, the word the 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 word autonomy, the activity of of being autonomous, seems to um, be a key characteristic of being able to disrupt that you know disrupt that process that's very kind of capitalist driven process and then somehow um, create uh, what you described Joni as a kind of micro value system that starts slowly to change the world from you know from below from from an autonomous point of view so um, it was quite interesting to think about value change um, and you've all kind of described uh, that a little bit in each of your approaches but Amy I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more describe um, you've just done a couple of days workshops on your fashion fictions project and it was fascinating to hear about the actual scenarios that a couple of those worlds that that you were asking people to embed themselves in and and create scenarios around and how they would address them. Um, so just wondered if you could give us a couple of examples. Yeah, sure. So yes, the, the workshop has taken place over the last couple of days. It's very fresh, fresh in my mind. Um, so we had a, a group of 12 uh, participants where I offered them five worlds from the more than 100 that have been submitted so far um, to the Fashion Fictions project. And they, they chose the ones that they, the one that they wanted to, to explore. Um, and so, yeah, one group was exploring a world where um, kind of garment components are, ex, are kind of exchanged as spare parts. So it's kind of almost like a spare parts culture of cars, but imagining that in terms of clothes. So it's like, oh, I need a yellow sleeve. I'll go and find the yellow sleeve. Or we really need a collar that's like this. And imagining these kind of components sort of circulating um, in the world. And then a, a, another group were working with a world where um, adults are only permitted to own 10 items of clothing and they they had fun kind of trying to work out how they wanted to interpret this rule kind of was it a very draconian um system where you mustn't have more than you know it was a kind of a restriction at the top down they decided they didn't want to spend two days thinking about um, kind of enforcement <laughs> and regulation and instead we're thinking about uh, that in that world you you might uh, adults might get 10 new items of clothing every 10 years five years or 10 years so a really kind of slow uh, flow of new items into the wardrobe but then a really rich culture of kind of um, exchange and reinvention and styling and that a, a piece of clothing in this world wasn't like a fitted item of clothing as we would know it which is quite inflexible really they would do a lot more with kind of uncut cloth as many cultures of the world have done for you know uh, most of history um you know a, a enjoying the kind of flexibility of that oh, and also people would use kind of non-textile items as part of their adornment so they did these great um fashion photos where they were um styling up things made of post-it notes and things made of uh, like children's building blocks and things were kind of part of the the, the dress um you know the expression of, of self through dress so yeah, and the, the, the conversations were interesting because um, a lot of the participants were saying, oh, I already do a bit of this myself. I already live in this world a little bit. And we were having fun kind of imagining these little pockets of, of resistance, pockets of alternative practice, which of course are just, they lay hidden. You know, it feels like we live in this kind of consumerist mainstream machine, but of course people are doing amazing things all over the place but kind of in, in lots of little little pockets. So we were enjoying imagining what happens if the little pocket becomes the norm. And we were trying to maximize the idea um, and kind of see where the, the conversation uh, takes you. So we enjoyed imagining the world. So we're um, a little sorry, I think, to come come back to the, <laughs> the real world. But I guess the idea is that we we take some of that, that sense of possibility with us um, as we, progress mm. and explore and very much as, as Joni was saying sort of the sense of um social validation that comes through doing things together I mean that is, is so important so I really agree Deirdre that you know autonomy is really important and agency 
but I think in terms of something that's so um, personal and therefore social as kind of constructing identity through dress, it has to be social, it has to be kind of connected, otherwise you're kind of out on a limb mm. uh, solo. That's a very like socially kind of risky thing to do, you know, and that that lovely sense of validation that you get through, uh, you know, I can really recognise that, you know, being with some of the people who get what it is that you're doing and they're, they're kind of complimenting your choices and the way that you've done something. I think that that sense of validation is so sturdy and it can really replace the sense of validation that you otherwise get by saying, oh, I've, I got it's a good one. I got it from Marx's or mm. oh, it's a good one. You know, it, mm. a posh, posh treat to myself. And that sense of validation that you get through um, uh, consum like commercial consumption, you can also get that in a in a social way, which I think is just magic, mm. really. And that's where the commoning comes mm. in, because you have that so. an interconnected, interdependent sort of sharing of you know knowledges and skills and tips and mm. you know, then it grows, isn't it? Yeah, and sharing confidence, of confidence yeah. together, it sort of gets conjured up, conjured up between the people somehow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, that reminds me uh, of something that Joni was talking about with me yesterday, which I wonder if you could um, expand on, Joni, but that after the group having worked, uh, or the groups having worked together, um, had this sort of idea of um, servicing clothes as a concept, you know, so... Um, Amy made a car analogy earlier, but um, the idea that, you know, we, we service our cars, we service, we have someone come to clean the gutters, you know, we, so we, we maintain our houses, we, we, we spend time, we do spend time maintaining other things in our lives and, and servicing things, uh, and there are people, you know, with the skills to do that, but what about servicing clothes as a concept was a really interesting idea. Thanks, um, uh, and that also or Jane's point about um about progress or questioning what we actually mean by progress and whether we have progressed in terms of clothing or really not um is you know it's quite a useful one here as well I think um because you know it um over the over the century well, over the decades clothing has become so much cheaper and so much more um so much more accessible I mean we were really struck um we did some weaving and my goodness, that took a long time to make a piece of fabric. <gasps> you know, if that was, you know, if you were having to make clothes from scratch or buy clothes from somebody who'd had to make stuff from scratch, you know, you're going to really treasure it, right? A piece of fabric is like valuable, actually. Um, but we don't have that, you know, but because it's really easy to go into Primark or whatever shop of your choice. Um, I'm using Primark because it is the kind of poster child for um you know uh easy cheap clothing consumption um because you're because you're able to go to you know a, a retailer and buy something really really cheaply that is also uh, quite cheaply made as well um and is designed to really only really kind of fit with this season or you know maybe maybe next year but then you'll start to look a little bit outdated if that's what matters to you um, it means that we've become we've become really you know, it's it's easy to throw things it's far easier to throw, to throw things away um, that that just don't fit a little bit with us than it is to um, to really hang on to them and you know if we if we sort of zone out from clothing it's something that we can see happening across a whole range of consumer goods where the idea of repair doesn't you know repair or adaptation you know it's like well pop down to curries or wherever. Um, uh, because that's just, yeah. And so, um, so at the moment we're in this mindset with clothing where you know, some of us might have memories of people in our family doing, you know, adapting, adapting a dress to be able to fit many different people at many different occasions. Um, but um, that's not been very well, that's not been privileged at all within our, within our culture, within, in our society. Um, yeah, so thinking about how thinking about maintaining an item of clothing um it's so that it's able to be wearable even you know um beyond what we might have imagined as its lifespan so um uh 
and this is where things like you know mending becomes really really useful and really really interesting and um and the idea that mending can be an embellishment as well which is really nice um yeah and there are lots of different skills in our communities that we should be able to draw on which also are better for the local economy as well because if we're supporting our local our local makers then you know we've got money flowing around the local economy rather than it just sort of disappearing off somewhere else so actually there are multiple wins so this idea of looking after our stuff because this isn't just about clothes, I don't think at all. The idea of looking after our staff has the potential for multiple wins right the way through our communities, right the way through our commons. Um, yeah, that also connects us to real life rather than the sort of crazy hyper consumerism that we've got at the minute. Mm. Um, Jane, um, you described um, a, a new flax growing project. And you also <laughs> were talking earlier about flax growing projects, many of them that then didn't sort of lead to anywhere. What, what will make a difference this time in the, in the flax growing project? What will make the difference to make that really, you know, achieve something and go somewhere and be sustainable? Well, I think that the difference is going to be made by um, by hopefully having enough people uh, becoming interested in actually being able to and to do enough work with it to be able to get it off the ground because we have this barn full of beautiful flax. It's all got to be rippled, uh, have the have the um, the seeds taken off and collected for next year's crop. It's got to be retted. Uh, it's got to be um, the fibers got to be extracted from the um, from the plant. It's actually it's quite a lot of hard work. And I think that quite often people who start um, projects like this, I mean, it seems like a, a really good idea, have no idea actually how complicated and physically demanding the work is. So I'm eyeing up hu um, hunky young men that I might know also <laughs> because, because certainly they, <laughs> although they may not think they're going to be interested in it, um, I'm, I'm trying to um, to think of people who, who have actually got the stamina because quite often these projects are involve middle-aged ladies who may not physically have the stamina to do the work that needs to be doing and we have a real problem in this country in that we don't seem to have any industrial flax machinery left. Um, I don't know, I don't quite know why. Um, I suppose it's because we because we lost the flax growing industry, mm. um, but it's it, it is really difficult. Uh, what I'm hoping is that somewhere, somewhere, we will, somehow we will find some industrial small scale industrial machinery that will really help. Because if we have to rely on uh, manpower, possibly woman power, um, it's going to be such a lot of work that I think. Um, I think that might contribute to it not being successful. I don't know, I hope not. I really do hope not. But I'm on a mission to convert people to um, to processing flax at the moment. Well, and I think in doing that, um, as you've all said that people, in creating those sort of communities of experience and knowledge, people sort of go on their own different journeys, seem, seemingly, yeah. don't they? Creating these value systems that then perhaps give the agency to lead to something else that you didn't yeah. imagine, you know, that, that you wouldn't be able to imagine. Um, one of the harder things to think about, uh, I suppose, is uh, how, how we might collectively need um, sort of alternative economic systems, as we were mentioning yeah. this morning, to help uh, uh, um, to, to integrate these ideas these grassroots ideas into because somehow they rub up against an economic system that um, is very difficult to work with and isn't you know isn't sort of suitable or fit for purpose for the world that we want to have in the future and also a thing isn't fit for for purpose in terms of um, to use Amy's phrase um, doesn't fit with the with a, a notion that the we want to 
work within the Earth's capacity to support life. That is a really nice phrase, Amy, that you use. And these things, you know, are important. And some of the things you've talked about sort of are, are, are moving towards a lovely idea of, of connecting with the Earth in a way that is not extractive, but actually, you know, is, is giving back and supporting um, Earth to support life on Earth. Um, so how do we, I know, Joni, you do a lot of thinking around high streets and reinvention of high streets and how alternative e economic systems might start to emerge, you know, in a, in a more constructed way through councils and through, you know, through some of the structures that we have. How do we start to do that to make a difference where these small little groups we've talked about, these subcultures, where they then surface and, and get a chance to be seen and experienced on in more mainstream ways yeah one of the things that we're playing with at the moment or you know hoping to explore in much greater depth um as time progresses um is a, a building on this idea that that there are spaces that are kind of like mutually complementary if you know what i mean so um uh in another academic life, I do stuff on, on economic development, regional economic development. Um, so this sounds like a real departure, but there is a thing you know, that really binds them together. And this is one of those spaces that's like, oh, actually, we could interconnect these two things, which is great. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, post COVID, uh, one of the things we've been hearing about a lot is about the decimation that COVID has had on our high streets and the significant and serious difficulties that our high streets had before, and are now having, you know, have just been ramped up like crazy. Um, and also thinking about how that that's led to an explosion in online shopping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then thinking through about what is it that the high street does that the online world can't do? And one of those is it's a space for people to get together, a space to have actual experiences with people, to meet people. So right the way around the world, a lot of, um, sort of high streets or city centres are doing a lot of stuff around the experience economy or thinking about what kind of experiences people are having in, in the place, you know, around sort of like economic activity. And so that got us thinking about the role, the, um, the role of making, mending and modifying, not just clothing, actually we're thinking about it in terms of repair cafes much more generally one of the roles that that could have in bringing people together to have those social experiences that we all really like and we remembered that most of us not everybody but most of us really really enjoy um uh but that also you know increasing footfall in our town centers or in our city centers you know that it would be you know, that I think there's a there's a, a big possibility there where we could find some kind of mutual advantage um yeah, so we're really interested in exploring um, repair cafes that have been working over the over a little while just to see um, what kind of impact that they have had and are having. Amy, could you see your a uh, couple of your fictional scenarios being placed as actual? I mean, your Blue Fashion Commons um, installation in our exhibition is is you know such a world. Could you imagine uh, putting a couple of those into an empty shop and, you know, exposing people to playfully to sort of those ideas and just seeing how they, you know, how they could work outside of a closed um, research environment or a closed, in a way, an exhibition that, you know, is in a gallery that um, people are visiting of their choice. What if it was just out there? Mm. Yeah, I think that the, the uh, my my aim is for the for these ideas to kind of the fictions to spill over into real life. That would that would be the you know uh, that's the dream really. Um, and you know we've planned in ways for, for to try to kind of seed that that to happen. Um, and for me, it's the the kind of the the dreaming the, the coming up with them in the first place and then prototyping them they're just steps along the way to the bit where we try and enact them and kind of merge them with real life um mm. that's the most exciting bit um and yeah definitely you know kind of um doing it in a real space as something people can come and engage with you know there's definitely um really exciting 
potential there. And there's mm. also a, an overlap in that lots of, I've been doing an analysis of, of the fictions that have been submitted and there's a really strong interest that comes up in loads of the fictions, ideas of having shared spaces for making and mending and connecting around clothes. Um, and like really lovely ones where it's like young men who get massively into making and modifying clothes. And it's like totally the cool thing to do um, in world, whatever it is that, um, you know, young men get really obsessed with um, uh, making their own sportswear and kind of uh, remixing and, and, you know, what's the latest thing. Just like really seductive um, uh, flights of fancy that, that then you think, well, why? What happens if we? What happens if that happened? You know, kind mm. of where, where would that take us? And that, I think what I really like about that when people are imagining is that it gives rise to the sense of a really diverse, um, really di diverse aesthetics for these things. Um, that you know, we, people have different preferences and different tastes and different kind of cultural, you know, sensibilities. And we need to have the kind of the repair cafe for every different. Um, aesthetic taste I suppose mm. you know that everyone oh this is my this, this is the one that I think is really cool oh this is the one for me you know you need a diversity of these things um so yeah but that that taste that kind of hunger for people getting together and doing things really comes through in the fictions and also interestingly um hardly any mention of brands and designers and kind of commercial shops loads of interesting com community run stuff and uh, quite striking kind of interest in um uh, things run by the local authority or by the state you know kind of so conversations about is it is it um uh you know kind of a, a state intervention or is it a commons thing which is you know slightly different um opens up really interesting conversations about kind of um the the place that we imagine these things uh, potentially sitting within hmm. and that uh, the the, idea, the community driven aspect of it people seem to be really interested in yeah absolutely um and um i mean i love that phrase you know the strap line for that presence on the high street could be you know our national wardrobe is heaving <laughs> <laughs> deal, deal with it here <laughs> here and now um mm. because uh yeah it, uh, you know that it just conjures up in your mind this kind of yeah huge wardrobe that's just and, burgeoning and if we, yeah if and if we were the only reason why we are not completely overpowered by the national wardrobe is because we ship it away mm. you know we ship our used clothes away the vast majority of them go to a distant country where we don't have to think about them and the the spare parts world if i remember correctly is initiated by there's there's a ban on on the export of used textiles and so this world suddenly has to think, what do we do? We can't just keep producing because we are lit, you know, literally going to drown in this stuff. Um, so, you know, it's kind of realizing, yeah, the, the national wardrobe can only um, keep from overpowering us because there's, cause there's a, an outlet and, you know, an outlet that leads to all kinds of problems and inequalities and, um, you know, injustices in a distant part of the world that we, we mm. prefer. We, it's very easy not to know about. Yeah. Yeah. And um, do any of you know about or use um, clothes sort of, uh, I've seen there are a few loaning type schemes that some designers of individual sole trader designers have set up um, for, for loaning clothes and re or renting them rather than buying them? Have you come across schemes that you are interested or can recommend? Go on, Joni. <laughs> so I, um, uh, um, I live in a very rural area. Um, so, and at the moment, uh, such things ha haven't really spread to us. I think it's a, it's, it's a really great idea. Um, and I, th I think that, you know, as part of a, you know, a much bigger sort of set of questions that say just actually, do we actually, um, why do we need to own stuff? And I think there are already, you know, people are discussing this. It's, you know, these are ideas that are in the ether. And I think that that makes the, um, them actually coming into fruition, you know, much more likely at some point. I'm really interested in your project, Amy. I think that this whole idea of imagining 
imagining uh, almost dystopias that are also kind of a utopia in some weird way. Um, a really useful way of just actually just just thinking about stuff. And I think you know um, uh, mm. if we could get you know if you're able to get that that say, that those kind of questions into the broader consciousness, I think that there's loads of scope for just uh, for helping people to reimagine our consumption patterns, maybe. Mm, and I think the thing that I've, I've tried to really go with is, I mean, a lot of speculative design, speculative thinking kind of projects are all about, um, well, they tend to be dystopian. Uh, they tend to be um, uh, very technology focused and they tend to be like all kind of um, uh, very focused on like, yeah, technological progress just continues to ramp up and somehow it solves everything. Whereas, I mean, I'm very, uh, uh, I have a, a, I think along the same lines as Jane was mentioning, you know, we, a lot of things in the past, a lot of ways of doing things were really great, really, you know, great um, sets of knowledge and great strategies and, and things that we, we need to be um, remembering and drawing from. And I mean, I'm just very into libraries. So I think of the past as a library of ideas that we can, you know, delve into. <laughs> Um, ob I mean, hopefully, obviously, not in a nostalgic way. You know, this, the danger for uh, that kind of, I suppose, the danger for that kind of way of thinking to seem nostalgic and we're just wanting to kind of reconstruct an imagined past that has all kinds of potentially problematic um, pitfalls, you know. But no, of, of, co of course, we can't recreate a past era but we can carry knowledges forward. And, you know, as, as Jane was describing, you know, get, keeping that knowledge going and being handed on um, is what's needed in order for, to, to allow that to happen. So yeah, I've been really trying to kind of make the project not be about, not be anything to do with kind of technological change, but really about um, different social norms. Because if it is just, and I, I say just in kind of inverted commas, because it's massive really just about social and cultural norms but the clothes i mean clothes as we wear them haven't really changed that much in decades centuries you know some bits of cloth woven or knitted and sewn together by somebody to, with a bit of machinery but basically by a person mm. but you know really i don't think that's going to change that much and so it sort of it feels like it, it's just there it's just it's actually not that far away if we could change our, our minds about kind of what is normal you know what's permissible what, what's normal um, and I think you know the continuation of, of of the of the caring skills and the maintenance skills and the making skills that that go along with that is just um, really important to kind of as a as a bed you know as kind of bedrock mm, and part of it I think is um uh, we were we were saying earlier is things going on in pockets that are really good but making that visible part of the trick yes. is, is making it visible and making it connect up so that um by share you know by sharing that knowledge and also um people are at different stages of their their journey their discovery journey their self learning journey their you know their their own building of their agency and so if something you know wonderful is happening in Exeter and and it could be and then people in Birmingham are sort of at an earlier part of the journey then sharing that connecting those things up so that because um you know Joni was saying something to me yesterday about you know the groups that you were observing and and uh, and, and seeing kind of where they got to on their journey um they um needed then a next step of like where do they then situate the new knowledge is what you said to me and that made me think um that you know if they are then can if other things are visible of other groups that have situated their knowledge into a high street shop or into you know a, a, a maker community somewhere else by sharing that knowledge and being open about it and making it visible people can then progress on their journeys, can't they? It's, um, uh, 
thinking about um, your work, Amy, and yours, Jane, as well. You know, both of you are relying very heavily on, you know, on, well, just the fact that you're, you know, able to attract participants or to attract people to join you in this journey, <laughs> these journeys, um, means that there are really interesting points of resonance within the broader cultural ether that you're able to tap into and then explore. And I think that that's what a lot of these kind of collective activities are doing. You know, and even if, you know, so our project, it ended, oh my goodness, I can't believe it, it ended two years ago. I can't, yeah, um, good. Um, uh, so even though it ended two years ago, those knowledges still exist um, as either practices that people are getting involved in, or as little points of resonance that at some point that somebody will hear something and go, ah, oh, yes, that's what I'm going to do next. Or, ah, oh, I want to be, yeah, 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 I want to be a part of that and stuff. So it's all kind of like building you know, or amplifying these ideas that are already <laughs> in the ether, but just maybe not as quite loud and present as we'd like them to be. Hmm. And Jane, uh, you were saying that, you know, the 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 request you're getting for um, spinning, dyeing and weaving workshops and talks and, you know, demonstrations that you're inundated. Yeah. So there is a burgeoning interest. Yes. There is an interest and um, the amongst the groups that I've been part of, and I've been part of a fair few groups over the years, there is always this, this a sense of community that we're all here we're all doing something maybe I don't like doing it that way but oh I've never seen anybody do it that way before now I might be able to do it that way um this morning when I was um because I was organizing an indigo vat for a weave group who have been wrapping warps for ECAT and people were looking at oh I never thought about using that oh is that going to work really well and then someone else had bought a small loom for making braids and she couldn't work out how to warp it up because it didn't look exactly like an illustration so I heard I was sort of lurking on the edge and I heard about three people all saying well have you tried doing it this way and have you tried doing it that way we under there's something fundamental in human beings I think that understands how these things might work and wants to do them um, and I one of the things that really pleases me is that I it, well there are two things one is that really if we hadn't developed those very early textile skills in being able to twist fibers together to make rope and weave baskets and things like that we could never have developed into settled communities because we needed somewhere to store our grain and we I mean I'm sure a mammoth could close clothe a whole village um, for quite a long time but then I don't suppose mammoths came along very often <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing is that I think that if if you taught the school curriculum and you looked at textiles how to do it you could cover everything because dyeing is chemistry, knitting, particularly very sophisticated Shetland um, lace knitting is physics. Um, you've got geography because we're importing things from other countries for beautiful colors and things. And we're sending our clothes over to, uh, to Flanders to be dyed. And then it comes back to London to be tailored. And we grow, up, we, we grow the wool in the Midlands and then send it off to Spain for something. All these things, geography, economics, uh, physics, chemistry, history, everything um, is all because textiles are such a fundamental part of our existence, you can relate everything to them. And um, that's what I think I should be telling the Minister for Education. Hurrah. Um, not, that will, <laughs> not that he will pay any attention, but, but um, I, I seriously think, I know if somebody had shown me dying as my first chemistry lesson, I wouldn't have been thrown out two years later because it would have engaged me and it would have made me excited and I could see the possibilities of, uh, and maybe then gone on to other things. Um, I just think it, it, it's fundamentally part of who we are. We need to create our nests, if you like. Um, and whether we do that with um, bricks and mortar 
or whether we do it with our knitting needles or our weaving looms or um, or any other thing that you can think of. I, I just think it's it is fundamental to the human condition. <laughs> well, that's a, a great um, concluding thought in a way. And, um, you know, the, um, the, the, what we've talked about, the sort of skills development, that the, the skills that have, of bygone eras that have always been there. It's about reclaiming those um, and um, putting them to, to, you know, to new, to new goods, to new social good, to new economic use. And as you say, it, um, you know, it will cover, it covers all bases really. It's a, a very powerful thing to connect people and skills um, and um, materials, materiality. It's, it has all those things in it when you think about clothing as a, a shared resource. Um, so I might want to borrow your green jumper, Amy, because that's a, a nice looking colour. <laughs> but it, it, it looks... Uh, I'm not relinquishing this back to the no. class for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I was always thinking when you asked about renting clothes, I, I really prefer to have a very, very long, like, long relationship <laughs> with my garments. I am I'm, uh, detached started through, through uh, a change in body shape or something literally <laughs> falling to bits beyond repair but um it can always become something else yeah uh, yeah i like to have a slow a slow borrowing from the fashion commons personally <laughs> yes <laughs> well it would be interesting to uh, have this conversation again in five years and see uh, and let's hope um things you know will have moved on and changed um does anyone have any last words of wisdom comments that they'd like thoughts they'd like to leave us with um i just wanted to say i mean you, you were mentioning about you know how uh, how things might have changed in five years time i think that um uh if we take from the position of now and look back five years i think we've come on an enormous um yes. way already i mean it's it's really fascinating to hear that you know how many people are aware now that clothing is a really big polluting problem um mm -hmm. and you know e even people who had had these blind spots and they're like i don't fly but oh my goodness look at my money clothes um mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay i got them on ebay why is that but um mm -hmm. uh it's it is it is amplifying these ideas are becoming much more visible which then gives us a lot more hope because we, um, we've got a lot of stuff to bounce off and a lot of stuff to keep talking about as well. Great. Mm. Yeah, great. And uh, thank you very much, um, panel, for your thoughts and for a, a great discussion. Um, if you've been uh, watching and listening to this um, via the Digital Craft Festival, which is on this weekend, um, or you've picked it up uh, at another time, um, seeing the recording, you know, in the future, uh, and you wish to put in your own thoughts um, and your comments, or, or give us some feedback, uh, we'd be, love to hear from you um, or, or through your social media. Um, please use the hashtag #WeAreCommoners, uh, and that will feed into any um, thoughts and discussions that we're all having uh, about uh, all things to do with the commons and craft and making and skills. Um, but thank you very much for joining us. Thanks again to the panel um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.